Sunday, August the 14th, 2005. Cypriot airliner Helios 522 is circling above Athens. Zulu Uniform 522, this is Athens ATC. Respond, please. There are 121 people on board, including 22 children. Nobody has been able to contact the plane for over two hours. Two F-16s are scrambled to intercept the renegade aircraft. As they approach, the fighter pilots see two people struggling inside the cockpit. Could this be a terrorist hijack? Then, dramatically, the plane veers off course and crashes at 400 miles an hour into a hillside north of Athens. Helios 522 is one of the worst air disasters in European history. It is also one of the most mysterious. This is the story of the last few hours of Flight 522, a story that has chilling implications for every air passenger today. Cyprus, Sunday the 14th of August 2005. It was the height of the Greek summer season, a time for families to travel. Lanaka Airport was packed with holidaymakers and tourists. The crew of Helios Flight 522 welcomed their passengers on board. There was a holiday mood among them as they settled in for their short flight from Cyprus to Athens. Flying the Boeing 737 were German Captain Hans-Jürgen Merton and his Cypriot co-pilot Pambus Charalambus. Flight 522 took off as scheduled shortly after 9 in the morning, heading northwest towards Athens. Ήταν πολύ παραξέντη. Τα παιδιά, τα παιδιά μου ήταν πολύ πολύ ανησυχά. Είναι εξαιρετικά ανησυχά. Three minutes after takeoff. On board Helios Flight 522, the captain reported a fault to ground control at Lanaka Airport. There was a problem with the plane's cooling system. It seemed minor and Cyprus Air Traffic Control gave Helios 522 the go-ahead to climb to its cruising altitude of 34,000 feet. This would be the last communication between Air Traffic Control and Flight 522. At her home in Cyprus, the co-pilot's mother sat down to watch television. I usually watch my favorite show at noon on Sunday, but instead of the show, there was a news flash. By now, Helios 522 was in Greek airspace. Athens air traffic controllers had been trying for over an hour to establish contact with the aircraft, but it was to no avail. Meanwhile, the silent plane circled in a holding pattern over Athens. I was with colleagues near the Greek Pentagon when we got a call from the Ministry of Defense telling us that a Boeing plane had uh, communication problems with Athens International Airport. One question was uppermost in the minds of the Greek authorities. Did Athens face a terrorist attack like 9-11? Two fighter jets were scrambled to intercept what is officially known as a renegade plane. What the pilots reported back shocked the authorities. The passengers were wearing their oxygen masks, the co-pilot was slumped over the instruments, and persons unknown were seen struggling with the controls. It seemed that the plane had been hijacked. Could it be targeted on Athens? The authorities now faced a terrible dilemma. Should the F-16 shoot it down, sacrificing 121 innocent people? The pilots had only moments to decide. 
The Air Force had 15 seconds to decide because the plane was flying over a populated area. But the decision was made for them. As Flight 522 ran out of fuel, the engine stopped and the plane veered off course towards the mountains north of Athens. My wife called me. She said a plane had crashed in Calamo. Then she said, it crashed in our village. News of the accident spread swiftly. And the relatives of those on board desperately sought information. I called my daughter-in-law, but she didn't answer her phone. I didn't know what else to do. I had to go to Larnaca Airport. In the house. It was chaos. Absolute chaos. Nobody knew anything. Everyone was shouting. No one assisted us. At the airport, the co-pilot's mother demanded answers. They said, we don't know yet. Nobody knew. When I asked them who was the co-pilot, their reply was, apparently the captain was German. They said, I didn't ask you about any German. I asked you about Harlumbus. Tell me if he was on the flight. Amidst the chaos of the crash scene, the scale of the tragedy emerged. All 121 people on board were dead. Among them, 22 children. Helios Flight 522 was one of the worst air disasters in recent European history. But what the air crash investigators uncovered would only add to the confusion and mystery surrounding this accident. Helios Flight 522 crashed in the mountains north of Athens. The debris field was scattered over two square miles. There were no survivors. It was the height of the Greek summer. With 40 degree temperatures, the countryside was tinderbox dry. Athens in August is almost a ghost town. Everybody is on holiday. The Greek emergency services were caught off guard by the scale of the disaster. To tell you the truth, when we got to the emergency call, we initially thought it was an exercise. This, you can't compare it. You can't compare it. The atmosphere that day was... There was smoke, there was fire, and there was this smell. The most terrible thing was the smell. It was the smell of death. Those who were there are still finding the experience very difficult to deal with. I got here as quick as I could, and I ran to see if I could save anyone. I couldn't save anyone. I put a child on my back. My clothes got soaked with blood. I didn't care. I, I just wanted to save someone. There. Right there. That's where the mother and the child were. The mother was lying here, and the small child was next to her, holding her hand. Right here. This terrible loss of life shocked the whole world. 
Distraught relatives demanded answers. Why did Flight 522 crash? Rumors and speculations about the cause of the crash erupted immediately. Helios 522 had lost all contact with air traffic control. So the Greek Air Force had scrambled two F-16 fighters to investigate. The fighters had seen the co-pilot slumped in his seat and the captain missing. At first, it seemed Athens had faced a terrorist attack from a hijacked plane similar to 9-11. As journalist Paris Karavanopoulos recalls. Our highest government source gave us the information that it was a terrorist attack because the F-16 pilots who were flying next to the Boeing had reported seeing a man wearing a mask in the cockpit. Many Greeks suspected that the F-16s had shot down the renegade plane. But the Greek Air Force immediately declared that neither of the fighters had fired their weapons. When the Greek authorities launched their crash investigation, a far more complex story started to emerge. The first key clue came from the reports of the F-16 pilots. Soon after, a series of new details started to emerge from the observations of the two F-16 pilots. The F-16 pilots had seen that all passengers on board were wearing their oxygen masks before the crash. This fact was confirmed by the Athens chief coroner. The impact of the crash was terrible, but many passengers were still wearing oxygen masks on their faces. This means the masks were deployed and they used them, or at least they tried to use them. The deployment of the oxygen masks meant one thing. Helios 522 must have experienced a major loss of oxygen and cabin pressure during its fateful last flight. Modern planes fly at altitudes where the air is thin and oxygen levels too low to sustain human life. So each plane is sealed before takeoff and then pressurized during flight to create a safe artificial environment. Passengers breathe pressurized air that's the equivalent of being at 8,000 feet even when the plane is actually flying at over 30,000 feet. If the cabin depressurizes, then oxygen masks are released immediately. The autopsies of the charred bodies led the coroner to a grisly conclusion. I am certain they didn't die from asphyxiation because their hearts and lungs were still functioning at the time of death. In other words, none of the passengers died before the crash. The cause of death was now established as the impact from the crash. But that didn't answer the key questions. Why did the Helios plane lose cabin pressure? And why did this cause the plane to crash? Then, a breakthrough. Amid the debris, the flight recorder of Helios 522 was found. It was now possible for the investigators to draw up a basic timeline for the accident. According to the flight recorder, Helios 522 took off as scheduled at 0906 hours. Straight after takeoff, the autopilot was engaged for the preset route to Athens. The plane climbed at 3,000 feet per minute. At 7,000 feet, a warning light was triggered indicating a problem with the cooling system. At 10,000 feet came the next indication of a problem. The flight recorder noted a warning horn in the cockpit. This indicated a loss of cabin pressure. At 14,000 feet, a further alert was triggered and the oxygen masks were deployed. Yet the plane continued its journey, climbing until it reached its cruising altitude of 34,000 feet. There it remained in autopilot for over two hours. Then, at 11.50, the autopilot was disengaged and the plane is flown manually. 
Just minutes later, the aircraft ran out of fuel. Both engines stopped, and shortly after 12 o'clock, the plane crashed. It begged the question, with so many alarms and warning lights going off in the cockpit, why did the pilots continue the journey? Was this crash caused by a fatal pilot error? Stories began circulating in the Greek press, blaming the pilot and co-pilot. It was alleged that the co-pilot, Pambos Charalambos, was unhappy, distracted from his duties by personal problems. But this was not how his colleagues remembered him. Pambos was, as we say, a really nice guy. He was a joy to be around, during work and after work. Other news stories queried the pilot's health. It was claimed that the co-pilot had a heart problem and that this might explain why he seemed unable to function properly. They said on TV that the pilots had problems. Who is going to believe that? He was tested regularly. Pilots uh, have health checkups every six months. He had his last test in April and everything was fine. Who are they trying to fool? There were also rumors about the co-pilot's incompetence, but these seem at odds with his professional background. He had almost two decades experience of flying. At one time, he even studied aircraft engineering in England. Planes were his first family, his priority. From an early age, he had a passion for mechanics. He even spent three years in Brighton studying aircraft mechanics. He was waiting for his promotion to become captain. He had accumulated all the necessary hours and day by day he was getting closer to this goal. Whenever you have an accident like this one and the crew is dead, the blame always falls on the crew. It is the standard answer to all accidents around the world. For independent air safety expert Kim O'Neill, pilot error is too convenient an explanation. Kim is going to try to piece together the evidence and find out what caused the crash of Helios 522. There is one obvious place for him to start, with the plane itself. The Helios plane was a Boeing 737, the most widely used passenger jet in the world today. An airliner with an excellent safety record. Kim begins his research by investigating the safety record of the actual plane that crashed. Flight 522 was a modern, up-to-date aircraft built only in 1998. But it already had its fair share of technical problems, as the co-pilot's mother remembers. My son didn't have any complaints about the company. However, he did tell me a few times that the plane had problems. Petros Theokaridis is an investigative journalist in the Cypriot capital, Nicosia. He also looked into the safety record of the plane. And it quickly emerged that this was not the first time there had been a potentially catastrophic loss of pressure on this plane. I had written about the pressurization problem that occurred last December during a flight to Warsaw. The plane had a pressurization problem, the masks dropped down and an emergency descent was necessary. Intrigued by these newspaper reports, Kim takes a closer look at the maintenance records of Flight 522. He focuses on the plane's air conditioning system, the system that helps pressurize the aircraft. Quite remarkable actually. The air conditioning system of this aircraft was repaired five times before the crash. Passengers frequently complained that the aircraft was very cold. The plane had a final maintenance check shortly before takeoff. It seems this is where the blame might lie. A maintenance engineer admitted to the Greek investigators that he may have left the pressurization switch in the cockpit in manual rather than an automatic. This mistake means that the aircraft could have taken off completely unpressurized. It's a vital piece of information. To understand the implications of this, 
Kim travels to Stansted to talk to an aircraft engineer. All commercial planes use the air conditioning system to pressurize the air in the cabin. So, can you tell me how the air conditioning system works in the aircraft? Certainly. All the air enters the engine in the intake here. That is bled off, off the engine and pass through pipework through the wing and to the air conditioning packs which sit underneath the aeroplane. Underneath the aircraft. The air conditioning packs regulate the temperature of the air going into the cabin. When the correct temperature is obtained, the air then leaves the plane from a valve at the rear. It is this simple procedure that pressurizes the cabin. So this is where the outflow valve is? Certainly, the outflow valve is here at the rear of the aeroplane. Okay. And that's where all the air from the cabin is exhausted overboard. Closing this valve ensures that the plane pressurizes. Leave it open and it remains unpressurized. It's a very simple mechanical system. Open, shut. Absolutely. Yet ultimately, control of the cabin pressure lies with the pilots. The pressure of the plane is operated by a simple switch in the cockpit. It's usually set to automatic, but it can be operated manually. It's the co-pilot's responsibility to monitor the plane's pressure throughout the flight. That's why the switch is located directly in front of him. Checking the pressurization is drummed into each pilot from the beginning of the careers, as Captain Rob Giles explains. When you're doing a pre-flight check, typically before you push back, you would go down each panel? Yes, the pre-flight check before engines start um, is logical. The captain start. focuses on the left-hand side of the central control panel, checking all the switches. I mean, this is while the co-pilot has to check the right-hand side, which includes the pressurization switch. So this is checked pre-flight? Yes. But it's also checked shortly after takeoff? Yes, during takeoff, after the takeoff sequence. Once In fact, the pressurization switch is checked twice before takeoff during takeoff, and again when the plane passes through 10,000 feet. So this, this panel is actually checked four times? Lots of checks, yes. If the plane should lose pressure, oxygen masks are deployed. But time is critical. This emergency supply only lasts 15 minutes, which means the pilot must take immediate action. If you get a depressurization, Initiate an emergency descent down to 10,000. So it depends on the pilots realising that the aircraft is under pressure. Absolutely, yeah. With timing critical and clear emergency procedures, it seems the helos pilots must have failed to carry out their duties. From the discovery of the flight recorder, we know that the emergency oxygen masks dropped at 14,000 feet. But instead of descending, the Helios plane continued to climb to 34,000 feet. This is the biggest mystery of all. Why did the aircraft not pressurize? Why did the pilots continue the flight even after the oxygen mask had dropped? Everything still seems to point to one explanation for the crash. Pilot error. Kim knows that he needs more information. He needs to understand exactly what the two pilots were really faced with during their fateful last flight. Helios Flight 522 crashed on August the 14th, 2005 in the hills north of Athens. All 121 on board died. It was the worst aviation disaster in Europe for 10 years. The cabin had lost pressure, but the pilots had failed to take emergency action. Now, Greek investigators had to find out why. Aviation expert Kim O'Neill has been conducting his own research into the accident. Both the pilot and the co-pilot of Helios 522 had many years of flying experience. It seems highly unlikely that they failed to notice the warning signals. Kim needs to understand exactly what the pilots were faced with in the cockpit. So he has booked a session in a cockpit simulator. There, to guide him through the complexities, is veteran flight instructor Julian Soddy. The simulator has been set to recreate the exact conditions faced by the pilots on Helios Flight 522. In particular, the aircraft pressure has been left in manual rather than automatic just as the maintenance engineer admitted to doing before the fatal flight. 
the simulator should behave in exactly the same way as Helios 522. The simulator takes off and climbs at 3,000 feet per minute. The aircraft's running itself now. What would the pilots ordinarily be doing at this stage? There's a fair amount of checking to do. Captain Sorry immediately spots a problem. Now, just look, this is the rate that the cabin is climbing at. Now, you've got another indication here as well, look. That's showing that it's in manual and it shouldn't be there. So this is what these guys would have seen. At this point, inside a real plane, the air would now be getting thinner and the amount of oxygen would be reduced. The inside of the aeroplane is climbing at the same rate as the outside of the aeroplane. Yeah. So, you know, we, we could be sitting in an open cockpit. We've got a master... Around three minutes into the flight, Julian and Kim get their first indication that all is not well. A light tells them that the instruments are getting too hot. The plane has a problem with its cooling system. This is crucial, as the pressure is controlled via the cooling system. The evidence from the flight data recorder indicated that the crew of Helios 522 experienced the same warning. In fact, the captain reported this back to the air traffic control in Cyprus. Both agreed that he would contact Helios maintenance directly to report the fault to them. No further action was taken. But the fault with the cooling system is related to a far more serious problem. The plane was losing pressure. Moments later, another warning is activated. It's a loss of airflow from the selected cooling zone. We've just gone through 10,000 feet. And we've got a warning. And we're climbing at 3,000 feet per minute. We've also got that warning horn. Just like the Helios 522, a warning horn goes off at 10,000 feet. This horn alerts the crew to the fact that their plane is not pressurized. We've also got an indication that it's in manual. Now, we know that this horn is solely in the air to do with cabin pressure. So I can't believe that two professional pilots would miss something as obvious as this. That's staring them straight in the face. Staring them straight in the face. I really don't understand how the Helios pilots could have missed all the obvious signs unless something has seriously distracted them. Perhaps a clue lies in the symptoms the pilots would have experienced as their brains were starved of oxygen in the unpressurized plane. The symptoms of oxygen starvation were first noticed by Second World War fighter pilots as their planes reached ever higher altitudes. In thinner air, oxygen supply to the brain decreases. At 18,000 feet, the body only receives half of the oxygen it receives at ground level. Pilots were losing their mental and physical abilities, eventually passing out. This deadly condition of oxygen starvation is commonly known as hypoxia. I, I hate to think about it, but it's actually quite a nice way to die because all you do is get um, more and more sleepy and eventually you just fall asleep. And then if you don't um, get enough oxygen, um, eventually you die. To experience the physical effects of hypoxia, Kim travels to RAF Henlo to subject himself to a dangerous experiment. A rapid decompression. Squadron leader Simon Chappell trains RAF flight crews on the hidden dangers of hypoxia. One of the most reliable signs of hypoxia is a, is a, a flushing, a feeling of flushing of the face. Um, conversely, if you look at the person who is becoming hypoxic, they're actually quite pale. Thereafter, you get um, some pins and needles uh, in the fingertips, around the lips. You get a dimming of the vision. You just you lose the ability to be able to see your peripheral vision. The test chamber will simulate the conditions of an unpressurized flight at 25,000 feet. The test subjects will experience the physical effects of lack of oxygen for four minutes only. Exceeding this time limit can cause permanent brain damage. This is a deadly environment, and safety is paramount. Climb the chamber to 8,000 feet at 4,000 feet per minute. You had a full, full run full of air when we rapidly decompressed. You could burst the lung. So like to breathe in, normally... As you ascend beyond 10,000 feet and up to, up to 15,000 feet, you'd become reasonably breathless even, even um, with only moderate exertion. At 15,000 feet, one quarter of your memory is gone. So, so you've got a 25% reduction in, in the ability to remember things which you've previously learned. So in an aviation environment, that could be, it could be catastrophic. Stand by for rapid decompression. In five, four, three, two, one, now. Hi, mate. What happened to this? What happened to this? 
Mr. Mask off your face slightly. Five seconds. You can feel the uh, the gas expand. Okay. What I'm saying, drop your oxygen mask now. To demonstrate the effects of oxygen starvation, Kim has given a simple children's puzzle to complete. Okay, Kim. What I'd like you to do is uh, have a go at the puzzle. Empty it first, and then, and then carry it. What do you notice about the atmosphere in here? Uh, it's warmer. Uh, it's still humid. Unit. But does the air feel any different to breathe? Absolutely not, it feels exactly the same. Just a slightly warmer, more humidity. One of the most dangerous aspects of hypoxia is that when you're exposed to an atmosphere, a hypoxic atmosphere, uh, like, like uh, an unpressurized aeroplane, the, the air doesn't feel any different to breathe. You, you, you breathe it in and it feels completely normal. And, and this is one of the, the, the most distressing things about hypoxia. It's a, it's a quiet harbinger of death. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, it is like being drunk, uh, or perhaps um, the beginning of a heavy head cold, or just extreme fatigue. How, how many minutes have you both been off oxygen now? Uh, actually, I'm not really sure. Two minutes thirty. There's a big clue. Two minutes thirty. Your attention and your vision starts to cone down into one area, and you find it very difficult to focus outside of what's immediately under your nose. So I should imagine that if there was a lot going on, uh, it would be very difficult to prioritise tasks. It's absolutely possible that an individual will become fixated on one task. We've seen it time and time again in our chambers. Three minutes into the test, and Kim is noticeably slowing down. Simple tasks are already beyond him. How old are you? Um, 21. Three minutes 30. Three minutes 30. I'd like you to take uh, 7 off 21 and carry on at loud. 7 off 21. Can you put some action on, please? Carry on. Carry on. Three minutes 45. Number one back on in 3 minutes and 49 seconds. Put the oxygen mask on, number two. With Kim dangerously hypoxic, squadron leader Chapel decides not to go any further and puts Kim back on oxygen. The onset of hypoxia, I would say rapid, accompanied by this euphoric, I can do it, which is not true. When you first drop your oxygen masks, many of you will have noticed that there's absolutely no change in, in the nature of the air that you're breathing. Absolutely it feels absolutely no different. Amazing. Uh, quite shocking, really. The hypoxia test sheds new light on Kim's investigation. We know that the Helios pilots climbed at 3,000 feet a minute in their unpressurized plane. By the time the warning horn sounded at 10,000 feet, hypoxia would have been setting in. What was that? At about 15,000 feet, they would have already lost 25% of their mental ability. At this point, the increasingly confused captain may have left his seat, possibly to try and turn off the alarm. Approximately 15 minutes after takeoff, both pilots would have passed out. The hypoxia experiment was a real eye-opener for me. I can now understand why the pilots missed the vital clues. I thought I was in control when clearly I was not. For Kim, Hypoxia offers a compelling explanation why the pilots seemed unable to react to the warning signs in the cockpit. Yet it also prompts a further crucial question. If everybody on board had succumbed to oxygen starvation, then who were the two people spotted in the cockpit by the intercepting F-16 pilots only minutes before the crash? How did they manage to avoid the hypoxia which had overcome the pilots? Who were they? And who, in particular, was the person seen wrestling with the controls? The crew list reveals one very strong candidate. The 25-year-old flight attendant, Andreas Prodromus. Since he was young, Andreas was always interested in planes. There were always planes in his room. When we were traveling, 
He was always trying to find out the model of the plane, and there were always photographs in his room. Andreas was a man obsessed with flying. Being a flight attendant was only the first step towards fulfilling his dream. He was training to be a pilot, but he was working as a steward. He was basically waiting for the day when he could finally put into practice what he was training for. Andreas had around 260 to 270 hours of flight time. At first, there was no hard evidence that the person in the cockpit really was Andreas. Three bodies were removed from the wreckage of the cockpit. The co-pilot, Cheryl Ambos, was quickly identified. But the other two bodies were so badly damaged, it took several days to identify them. During the identification process, there were those who could be identified by their relatives. Then, there were those we could only identify using DNA methods. To DNA. Blood samples found on the rudder controls were matched to Andreas's DNA. This confirmed that he was in the cockpit during the final moments of Helios 522. Using the same methods of DNA analysis, the third body was identified as his girlfriend, Harris. This led investigators to an astonishing conclusion. These two young flight attendants were trying to save the plane. Six minutes into the flight. With the oxygen supply dropping and confused by the effects of hypoxia, the pilots are struggling to make sense of the situation. For flight attendants Andreas and Harris, the deployment of the oxygen masks is the first dreadful sign they have that something is seriously wrong. <laughs> The chief purser takes off her mask to reassure the passengers that all is well. She then tries to contact the flight deck to no avail. Fifteen minutes after the deployment of the masks, the oxygen runs out and slowly everyone succumbs. At some point, Andreas must have fitted himself and Harris with portable oxygen. Andreas goes forward to investigate. He finds all the passengers and his colleagues unconscious. But they are about to be confronted by a formidable barrier. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11, all cockpits are fitted with specially reinforced doors. The only way in is by entering a security code. I don't know whether he knew the code or not, but just imagine, in the panic and confusion, well, you can easily forget things you know. Still in autopilot, Flight 522 is locked into a preset holding pattern over Athens. Two F-16s have been scrambled to intercept the renegade plane. As the two fighter jets approach, Andreas and Harris finally gain access to the cockpit. How, we may never know. The two fighter pilots watch helplessly on as Andreas takes control of the stricken plane. He disengages the autopilot about 15 minutes before the crash. But then, the first engine cuts out. He always used to say to me that planes don't fall from the sky. But when the pilots are cool-headed, nobody gets hurt. And even when it's lost its engines, it can land. But time is running out for Helios 522. With the fuel exhausted, the second engine cuts out. I sensed something was wrong because I tried to call Andreas on his phone. He didn't answer me. 
So obviously, I'm his dad. I sensed something was wrong. The mystery of Flight 522's final moments appears to be solved. But for Kim, one question remains, and it's the biggest of all. Pilots also check for problems with pressurization before the flight takes off. When the aircraft was on the ground, why did the pilots not realize something was wrong? If Helios 522 had a problem with the cabin pressurization system, why did the pilots not notice it during their many pre-flight checks? It leads Kim to a disturbing question. The plane was a Boeing 737, an aircraft in service with almost every airline in the world. Could this plane have a catastrophic design fault? Helios Flight 522 is one of the most mysterious crashes in aviation history. It seems the plane took off with a faulty pressure setter. The pilots failed to act on the warning signals as they succumb to hypoxia, starvation of oxygen to the brain. But for air safety expert Kim O'Neill, that's only part of the answer. It fails to explain how two experienced pilots could have missed the faulty setup before takeoff. To find the answer, Kim decides to investigate previous depressurization incidents on board Boeing 737s. He makes an alarming discovery. I found an incident from 2003 in which a Boeing 737 suffered a complete pressurization system failure. Everything seems to have gone wrong. The aircraft was flying between Marseille and London Gatwick in May 2003. At 34,000 feet, the plane suddenly lost pressure. This problem was detected in time by the pilots and the aircraft was safely landed. But it emerged that the loss of pressure was caused by burnt wire. This wire is crucial as it connects the pressure switch in the cockpit with the outflow valve. If this valve is open, the plane depressurizes. Investigators later established that the main wire and the backup run through the same loom. In other words, if one wire fails, they both do. This is totally contrary to safe design practices. Backup systems should always, always be rooted away from primary systems. Helios employees reported a burning smell on Flight 522 only days before the crash. But it seems that no further investigation was made at the time. As Kim investigates the 2003 incident further, he makes another shocking discovery. Even though the plane had lost pressure, all the instruments in the cockpit still looked normal. There was no indication that the pilots had a problem. If this happened to the Helios pilots, then this would explain why they missed the warning signs. Throughout all the pre-flight and takeoff checks, the Helios cockpit would have appeared fine. On the ground, everything looks normal to the pilots. In the air, when the alarms go off, the flight deck still looks normal. And then hypoxia sets in. Starved of oxygen, the pilots would have then become increasingly confused about the conflicting messages their instruments were giving them. This could explain why they did not descend in time to a safe altitude to avoid hypoxia. This wiring problem with the 737 was highlighted in a report by the Air Accidents Investigation Branch. The AAIB recommended to Boeing in 2003 that the main and backup wires should be reinforced and separated across all their 737s in service. So far, Boeing has not responded to these safety recommendations. Kim's discovery highlights a potentially fatal design flaw which could explain the Helios crash. It also raises enormous questions about the safety of all Boeing 737s flying today. Every five seconds, a Boeing 737 takes off somewhere around the world. There are over 4,000 in service.
Air accidents are rare, but when they do happen, they are devastating. Πολύ δύσκολο να δεχτείς ότι θα έρθει στο σπίτι σου και το τυπλό σπίτι θα είναι άδειο. Απλώς μια δικαίωση. Αυτό που χάθηκαν. Nothing else.